Chapter 12 in Mark's Gospel. Tuesday of Holy Week, Jesus is teaching, and we have some of his most memorable teaching moments and all of scripture recorded in chapter 12. The chapter begins with perhaps the sternest parable Jesus ever told, a parable of judgment, in particular against God's own people, the people of Israel, who rejected the prophets, and finally were even going to reject Jesus, God's own son, the heir, with this absolutely foolish and irrational conclusion, if we kill the heir, the inheritance will be ours. Who will take this vineyard from us? But Jesus says that's not true. He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is a really a very stern preaching of the law, meant to open people's eyes. Sadly, for the, some of the people who knew that this parable was being told against them, they were unwilling to accept that word of the law. And instead of repenting, they simply dug in their heels and were beginning to seek a way to arrest him. And only the fear of the people kept them from laying their hands on him right there at that moment. Teachable moments. How about this one? The test. They want to trap Jesus in his talk. And so they come and they butter him up. We know that you are true and you don't care what anyone thinks. You're not swayed by appearances. You truly teach the way of God. Okay, butter him up. But now what's the real test? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Any self-respecting Jew would say, we have, no, we have no king but our God, right? How can we support Caesar, who is not part of God's people and who, in fact, has been oppressing us? Jesus, in such a brilliant teaching moment, he knows their hypocrisy. He says, bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And I, this is based on archaeology. It seems that the, the denarius coin on one side would have the face of Caesar, much like our quarters and nickels and dimes have the face of one of our presidents. There on that side, they would find the likeness that Jesus refers to, the picture of Caesar. And on the other side would be the inscription that said Pontifex Maximus. In other words, Caesar's claim to divinity. And if that's the case, then this is really a striking moment, as you can imagine Jesus picking up that coin, pointing to the picture of Caesar and saying, give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. Look, his face is on this coin, so give it to him. But then flipping the coin around and saying, you don't worship him as if he is divine. Give to God the things that belong to God. And that is just such a great and awesome teachable moment. What does it mean for us? Well, it means that our citizenship truly is in heaven, right? We have, we have no worries or concerns in the end about things on this earth because we give full glory to God. We don't set up as the object of our worship, as our idol, earthly government, as if they are the only saviors we have and that we should look to them for every good thing in life. No, of course not. We do, we do, however, live under government and we thank God for the gift of good government and we cheerfully, as Christians, support the government, including with paying our taxes. After all, who cares? Money is something that belongs to this age. It's going to pass away. So give it back to Caesar if it belongs to Caesar. And we too have these coins that have pictures of our leaders on them. We don't have to hold on so tight-fistedly to our cash. In fact, that's something we're going to see come up yet again in Mark chapter 12 before we're done. But first we have the next test, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, very much like people today. They, they have a rather ridiculous example for Jesus with seven brothers all marrying the same woman and saying, ha, what kind of, what kind of a mess is this going to be at the resurrection? Can you imagine the reality TV show that you could make out of this scene? But Jesus Jesus uh, just takes them to the woodshed. The reason you are wrong, you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Bam, Jesus, way, way to go. Land a big blow. They, when they rise from the dead, they're not going, it's not going to be like it is now. They're not going to marry or be given in marriage. And then you have to know this, the Sadducees only accepted as God's word the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses. So where does Jesus turn to point them to the reality of the resurrection? Well, he goes to the books of Moses and the passage in particular about the burning bush where God uses the present tense and says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not I was, 
but I am, as if these men who had died so long before Moses was on the scene were still alive. Well, they are still alive. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. To him, all are alive. You are quite wrong, is the conclusion that Jesus finally has for the Sadducees. Sometimes people wonder about this. They say, well, marriage is such a great and awesome gift here and now. I, I can't understand how it could be better in heaven with that being something of the past. Understand that we will, even though the relationships will be changed, as in, when we are all together in heaven and perfect, we will have even greater joy in one another than we do in the circumstances and the arrangement that God has for our lives here on this earth. So don't be quite wrong like the Sadducees, but rejoice in God's mighty power and the promise he makes that he is the God of the living, not of the dead. You're never going to be dead to God. We have then a scribe coming up with a very scribe-like argument, which commandment is the most important of all. It's not all that unfamiliar. Sometimes we will play these games too, trying to pit part of God's law against another part and saying, okay, if I have these two competing laws, how can I keep them both? So I'm going to make excuses for myself breaking one by telling myself that there's another one that's more important. But Jesus cuts to the chase and he here so beautifully summarizes what we call the two tables of the law. Love the Lord your God. And then the second, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these two. There's the entire summary of God's law. And it focuses us outside of ourselves on our God and on our neighbor. And the scribe, he's willing to say, okay, he acts as if he's over Jesus. You're right, teacher. And when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After a few tests like this, no one dares to ask Jesus any more questions. Jesus now teaches of, about his divinity and the fact that he is the messianic uh, fulfillment of the messianic promise that David would always have a king to reign on the throne. Then there are warnings about hypocrisy. It's not all about show. God cares about the heart. And then the chapter ends with the beautiful story of the widow's offering. Again, we already saw that we don't have to hold on tight-fistedly to our cash. We can give it to Caesar if it belongs to Caesar's. And here's something else we can do with it because we know that money is only good for this age. It's a tool God gives us to use and to support ourselves now, but it should never be an object of worship. And what do we find, find out? Well, this, it's a beautiful thing in God's eyes when someone gives from the heart, when their heart is not set on earthly wealth, but when they are willing to give even more than would seem prudent or wise, perhaps, when they would give, you know, keep the kind of that saying, you have to keep giving until it feels good. You get past the point of where your fingers are still clinging tightly to that money and only reluctantly do you turn it over to God, but where you cheerfully say, Lord, what you have given me does not belong to me. It belongs to you. I'm willing to give it away. And I know that in doing so, I will not be lacking anything. So Jesus says, there's people here who are actually funding the work of the temple, not like this widow is going to. But in God's eyes, the large sum means less than the attitude of the heart. And this poor widow, whose two small copper coins would probably barely pay a priest for a single day, Jesus says, has put more in than anyone else. They contributed out of their abundance, out of the overflow, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything she had such confident trust does she have in her Lord and in her Savior. And what a beautiful thing that is in the eyes of our God. All right, that wraps up chapter 12. On to chapter 13, still on Tuesday of Holy Week here in Mark's Gospel, the last six chapters, the events of the last week of Jesus' life.